Before beginning my own talk, I'd like to acknowledge a few of the talks that have come before me today. First, I'd like to bow to the King of Ardent. <laughs> then I'd like to say how heartened I was to hear Sarah talking about seeing things that others did not see. And I hope she'll continue. And you'll know in a few minutes why that was so heartening to me. And it's because I'm hearing things that many others do not hear. And then lastly, I'd like to acknowledge William's playing of the didgeridoo. As I sat listening, I realized he was taking an instrument from a tradition that we would normally think is completely separate from another tradition, the European classical. And he was bringing them into conversation. So he was removing what we would have thought to be the boundaries of those two worlds and bringing them together, which leads to my purpose today. Back in the 1960s, there was a television show featuring a man named Wilbur and a horse named Mr. Ed. Wilbur was really surprised when he discovered that there was a horse left behind in the garage of a home he had recently purchased. But he was shocked when he heard that horse speaking to him. The series continued with Wilbur's comedic attempt to keep anyone from knowing that he had a talking horse, but more importantly, to keep anyone from knowing that he himself was having conversations with Mr. Ed. Something similar began happening to me. So I put the question to the universe. What am I supposed to do with this? What am I supposed to do with this newfound capacity to hear horses speaking? And I got an immediate answer. It was in the form of an animal advocacy poster mounted on the wall of the Atlanta airport. And it said, be the voice for those who cannot speak. So I decided to do other than what Wilbur had done. I decided to talk about it. In fact, I wrote a book about it. Because hearing horses speaking has completely altered my understanding of what it means to be a human being, and particularly what it means to be a human being in relation to other sentient species on Earth. It all began on a horseback ride in Costa Rica. <coughs> the horse I chose to ride is Arenal. I'm sorry, it's Titan. We were riding to the river Arenal. When we got to the river, we were the last ones to cross. When, Arnal, when uh, Titan put his hooves up on the bank to come out of the river, I lost my balance and I fell off into about four feet of rushing water. But I was fine. I stood up completely soaked and laughing. But the horse was not happy. In fact, he was clearly upset. Anybody could have told from his constitution that Arnal was, uh, Titan was looking at me with trepidation. It's okay, I'm all right, I told him. So I climbed back on and we continued on our trek. And as we continued, I felt incredible. I felt so relaxed and so peaceful, taking in the beauty of the natural surroundings, the sweetness of the air. And so it didn't seem at all strange or at all odd when I began to hear Titan speak. I cannot believe that happened. That's never happened to me before, he said. No one's ever fallen off before. Are you OK? Well, I'm fine. I already told you that, Titan, I replied. But he would not be consoled. And he spent the remainder of our trip talking about how bad he felt, how shameful he felt. He wondered if he was going to be in trouble. And as we approached the barn at the end of the trail ride, I heard him say one more thing. He said, you can hear me speaking. And now that I know that, I want you to tell Debbie that she's wrong about me. I don't need any more training. By now you're wondering, Really? How can this be possible? 
Obviously, the horse is not moving his mouth. He's not uttering words by the use of his tongue or his lips. But I can hear him clearly. It's an unspoken yet intelligible exchange of thoughts and ideas and feelings that we're sharing. When I do as Titan has asked, and I tell Debbie what he said, she was perplexed. Now, I was a complete stranger to her. I was renting a place in her cabin retreat. She looked at me, and then she said, how do you know about that? Well, as it turns out, Debbie and the stable manager had been having a conversation that week about how it was important that they send Teton back for training. He heard them. He understood them. Conventional wisdom says that horses don't speak. And it says that people don't understand them. Of course, highly sensitive horse trainers have the capacity to recognize through horse behavior what's going on with them. For example, when a horse pulls its ears back or it begins licking and chewing, or dropping its head in a certain kind of way. Even the way the horse exhales sometimes can tell you what's going on with him emotionally. But I'm talking about a very different kind of communication direct communication, which is an entirely different matter. So what, what is that? What happened? How can we understand that? Here's a possibility. At the moment that I was about to fall off of Titan, I had, in a split second, two choices. I could grasp myself, tighten my muscles, get a grip and prepare for the fall. Or I could let go. I could just let go. I did the second. And I think that it's possible that in the process of letting go, something opened, something shifted, such that Titan was able to reach me through another mode of communication than what I normally use. I think it might have something to do with the heart. So let's talk about that for a moment. There's a researcher named Rowan McCready who's now come to realize that the heart actually emits the largest electromagnetic field of any other organ in the body, 60 times greater, 60 times greater than the brain, as measured, measured in an EEG. And McCready has observed that the heart is involved in the processing and the decoding of intuitive information that is generally outside the range of conscious awareness. The heart and brain appear to be in a conversation that is two-way, dynamic, integrated, and continual. And that process is biological, neurological, biochemical, and energetic. Since speaking with Titan, I've had a variety of conversations with many different horses. In some cases, I hear specific words, like with Titan, who said, tell Debbie I don't need any more training. In other cases, what I get is a very deeply intuitive awareness that I can then translate into specific words. In the case of a horse named Amarillo, what I got was a vision that I think Amarillo shared with me. What happened was Amarillo was pretty sick. He was not eating well, and he was cribbing, which means chewing on non-nutritive substances like wood. The vet didn't know what was going on. When I came to visit, I asked Amarillo myself, what's the matter? And what happened was he showed me an image of a pus-filled sack buried deep 
underneath of his jaw. So I told his caregiver, who passed it on to the vet, it was three weeks later that they realized it was an abscess because it burst and it needed to be surgically removed. So how was Amarillo able to do that and how was I able to understand? We know of the occurrence of interspecies communication. Mycorrhizal fungi and trees exchange information about essential nutrients available. We may not yet have the instruments to observe what is happening when horses communicate in the way that I have described to you, and we may not yet have the scientific method to replicate such an experience. There are, however, researchers who are trying. Denise Herzing and a group of scientists, actually engineers at Georgia Tech, are really interested in dolphin communication, and they're trying to decode the language of dolphins. But more than that, they're trying to create interspecies communication through an engineered device called a chat. And this device is, device is submersible. It's a computer. The diver wears it when they come into a pod of dolphins, and the dolphins begin to chatter with their language. The computer program decodes that language so that the human can see what's being said. And what they're really hoping is that that computer then will be able to, in turn, take human language and send it back to the dolphins. Maybe you have already experienced interspecies communication with an animal in your life. There are countless stories about dogs, for example, picking up when their people are on their way home. Even if they come home at different times during the day, under videotape, it's been captured that a person is leaving their office, and in that moment, a dog is getting up and going to the door to wait. A report just came out that a group of neuroscientists has now located in the dog's brain a specific region that is activated when a dog senses what's going on with their humans. Dogs are especially tuned to human communication signals. So if you've ever thought or sensed that your dog or another pet understands you in a way that seems really profoundly deep, probably has. I recently met with a group of people who were in a training for equine facilitated learning. I was asked to join the group in the barn with four horses who had spent the entire week with that group. So I sat down and I went into a meditative state so that I could communicate with the horses. And it was pretty clear to me that they had something that they needed to say to the group. So I offered that translation. And what one particular horse did to communicate the message was to show me an image of a pasture and a herd of horses on that pasture. And that pasture did not have enough grass for all the horses. So what they were telling me is that that group was in a, in a state of agitation. They were contentious. They were not functioning well. And the group knew it. They were surprised to know that the horses they'd been working with knew it as well. As I'm sitting there and I'm particularly, I'm sharing a particular message for one person in the group, and it's a very emotional message, I start to doubt myself. I start to think, okay, wait a minute. What's going on here? What am, what am I doing? What is this? And I, and I start to hesitate, and I'm thinking, I'm, not, I'm just not going to go on. And just then, something fairly remarkable happens, and I'd like to show you in a very brief film clip as I explain to you what's going on. The horse named Beauty walks around the circle and stands right behind me. And as she's standing there, and her face is right over my shoulder, she's saying to me, trust yourself. Trust the process. We are your herd now, and we are here to support you. Here's what I have come to realize. Technology has made expansive communication possible, such that we can now speak with and hear 
other people almost any time and at anywhere. But there is also another kind of communicative capacity emerging, and that is the capacity of humans to understand and be understood by other sentient beings. But this is not a technological capacity. It's a biological one. Neurological, biochemical, biophysical, energetic. Pulsations of the heart moving synergistically through the brain. The phenomenon, which for now I'm loosely terming the supralinguistic interspecies flow of communication, is an experience that I wanted to share with you so that together we can make the path for a heightened awareness of the interconnection of all sentient species on Earth. I'd like to show you um, so a conversation I'm having with a horse named Blue Star. And so that's part of the message. The part of the message is that that's real. But people don't necessarily realize that horse love is real love. <laughs> I know, honey. <laughs> I know. I heard it. I'll tell it. I'll explain mm -hmm. it. It's real love. Oh. It's not like, oh, isn't that a sweet pet? Oh. It's actually real, and their hearts feel it, oh. and it's big. And what he wants you to know is that they depend on you. <laughs> they depend on you. <laughs> um, to, not just to feed them and vet them and take care of them, um, keep them warm, but they depend on you emotionally. No. Not so much no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, the camera's there. And he yeah. said, now are you ready for the regular photo? <laughs> Oh, oh I know, sweetie. I know. Oh I'm gosh. very happy to be with you. I'll tell everyone. He said everyone who has a horse or who cares for horses or who breeds them or raises them um, should understand that. No. And he doesn't think that that's really clear. He said people get emotionally dependent, uh, but that he said most of the, often what they do is they project themselves and their own needs onto the horse. Mm. But he said actually the horse feels very deeply. Mm. And uh, so if people could change their relationships with horses in any way, it would be for that feeling to be acknowledged. Mm. For that true love to be recognized. Oh, goodness. This is true love. Oh, goodness. You just had lots to say. <laughs> All right, now let's pretend. The animal advocacy poster that I saw in Atlanta was very inspiring to me. Be the voice for those who cannot speak. The thing is, animals can speak. Just imagine the incredible possibilities that would open for us, humans, were we to embrace this capacity to understand what animals are saying. Thank you, Ted UVA.